to the Digital Discourses, the Platform Economy, the Future of Work. I'm your moderator, Amelinda Panukus Maningtias from the Center for Digital Society, Universitas Gajah Mada, Indonesia. I am also part of the Fair Work Project Indonesian team. Thank you for taking the time to join us today as we talk about how the platform economy changed the world of work. Today's event is organized by Kuta Institute in conjunction with Center for Digital Society and Engaged Media. Digital Discourses is a conference series that focuses on exploring the effects of digital transformation on society, politics, the economy, and the environment. The next edition of Digital Discourses will be held in October 2022 with the theme Science slash Fiction, where we will look at the way new technology, which used to be only sci-fi movies, is starting to change our society and our life. So now let's back to today's topic. In recent year, we have witnessed a rapid growth of numerous apps that provide services such as right hailing, food delivery, cleaning service, delivery service, design, and many more. These platforms are not only making our life more convenient, but also provide job opportunities for many people. Although the types of gig jobs may not be new, people now have freedom to structure their working lives. It's often dubbed as the platform economy, and it has become a lifeline for people who are otherwise unable to find regular jobs and provides opportunities for many to find side gigs. However, as the platform economy progress and employs more people, it has become clear that the price of such flexibility and freedom is the absence of security and benefits. Their status as contractors, not as permanent workers, puts them in especially precarious positions since more and more are depending on what were once side jobs as their primary income. With platforms growing in importance, it has become more necessary to understand how does the platform economy affect the future of work and what will working look like in the future. And that is why in today's digital discussion, we have invited researchers in this field to present their findings and their knowledge on the current challenges of the gig economy in their respective countries and to discuss the future of work. But before we start, I would like to share that today's event will be divided into two sessions. After all of the three speakers presenting their insight, finding, and knowledge, we will have a Q&A session. Participants are welcome to ask questions by using the chat feature on the live side of the screen. And for those of you who are joining us on YouTube, you are also welcome to participate in the Q&A session through the live chat feature on YouTube. And if there's any of you from Indonesia who want to participate in the Q&A session, but are not comfortable with your English, uh, feel free to type your questions in Bahasa Indonesia. I'll help to translate it later to our speakers. And at the end of the discussion, three participants with the best question will receive a souvenir package from Gute Institute. So without further ado, I want to introduce our first uh, speaker, which is Mr. Os Ayanak to the spotlight. Nah, Mr. Os Alyanak is a cultural anthropologist whose research spans labor migration, urban studies, religion, and masculinity. After finishing his PhD from the Westington University in St. Louis in 2019, he moved to Germany as a Volkswagen Stephen postdoctoral fellow. And starting from April 2021, he has taken on a postdoctoral research position at the Fair Work Project, joining a team of scholars to explore working conditions in the platform economy in Germany. He is also a visiting researcher of the Globalization, Work and Production Research Group at the WZP Berlin Social Science Center. Please welcome uh, Oz Ayanak. Hi, Oz. How are you? Hi, Amel. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm, I'm doing great. I'm actually currently in Turkey right now. It's been about two weeks that I came here um, to visit my family. 
So what can I say? You know, the sun is out. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> I'm enjoying it. Yeah. I'm, I'm very, very happy to be here. And thanks also to Yvonne for inviting me and to the Goethe Institute for reminding me to share some of my insights from the Germany research that we've conducted in the last uh, year and a half. Okay, then I'll give the floor to you. All you. right, thanks a lot. I am going to share my screen, the PowerPoint that I have presented for today, which is on uh, the fair work research that we have been conducting in Germany for the last uh, year and a half, as I mentioned. So for the year, last year and a half, I've been a postdoctoral researcher located in Berlin, uh, doing the uh, fabric research, uh, which takes place in 30 different countries uh, as we speak today. Um, so I was the country lead for the Germany research, and I was affiliated during my stay in Berlin with the Technical University of Berlin. Uh, in about two weeks, I'll be moving to the central team in Oxford to, uh, to join the central team there and continue doing fabric research uh, in Germany, but also in a number of other countries. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So um, here we go. The, I'm, I'm going to divide this presentation into three, basically. The first part is going to be about fair work and what we do, uh, how, do how we do the research that we do. And then I'm going to move to the Germany side of the story and then provide some insights from what we found from the Germany research uh, and briefly talk about the pledge campaign that we have. And finally, if there is time, but if there is none, please Q&A session is all for this. We're going to discuss all together if there's uh, a possibility that what we are talking about here is the future of work. And if it is, then what awaits us, uh, what awaits us in, in the future of work. So here we go. Fair work. Brief overview. So platform economy, as Amel has already done the introduction, is, 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 a, is, a, is a kind of new phenomenon that's been going on for actually quite some time, but it's becoming more and more prominent all over the world in the last five to 10 years. In Germany, definitely in the last five years or so, we have seen so many new platforms, uh, digital labor platforms that uh, came into the market and uh, a lot of workers also choosing these platforms to find employment. So the way that we define a digital labor platform is basically a company that uses digital resources. So interfaces, web, web pages, et cetera, to mediate value creating interactions between the consumers and the individual service providers, the workers themselves. So there's the workers and the consumers, and there's the platform that mediates that relationship. That to us is the definition of a platform. And the platform economy itself is basically a market uh, in a sense that, uh, that provides a short-term supply and demand for labor. And uh, the work itself can be contractual, but it can also be out of a contract, can be free on a freelancing basis, for example, and is of course mediated through a digital platform. And as fair work, we basically, what we're trying to do is not just to produce knowledge, but also try to produce change in this economy. So this is an action-oriented research project that locates itself in the midst of different stakeholders. These are the policy makers and the government of officials, the concern of, of seeking jobs in this economy and the, and the platforms themselves. And the Fairbrook project negotiates with all these different actors and collects data from different actors to, to do its research. And as I mentioned, we are currently doing this research in 30 different countries. Germany is only one of these countries. And the same research with the same methodology, which I'm going to get into in a second, is done in all of these different, uh, the different countries, including Indonesia, of course. So in terms of our methods, we start with the desk research, which is basically a sort of like, like know-how with regards to what platforms are fun lists that we can actually start the research on. And after we get to we get that list and we look at the policies, the labor policies, et cetera, that are in place in the country context, then we move on to the worker and manager interviews. So basically with each platform, we try to interview six to 10 workers and collect data based on the working conditions, the payment structures, the contracts, et cetera. And with managers as well, we also try to sit down with them and many of the managers are sitting down with us to provide additional data with regards to how the, their platform, the business model itself functions. And then we put all of this together after many months of research, many months of data collection. And then based on the data that we've collected, we score these platforms out of 10. And the scores are peer reviewed by the country team members, but also two additional reviewers from the Fairwork uh, network itself. 
So basically, we have five principles that we evaluate each platform by. These are the first one is fair pay, so payments. And there are two, two thresholds under each principle. With fair pay, what we're looking at is that the platform pays at least the local minimum wage, and then for an additional point that it pays a local living wage. Second principle, fair conditions, looks at the conditions at work and whether the workers feel comfortable that there are not risks that they have to endure, that they have to face, confront when uh, working for these platforms. So the first threshold for this principle is that the platform itself takes measures to mitigate task specific risks. So this could be something like providing bikes or making sure that the bikes are up to date and in good condition to, to work, providing helmets or providing cleaning materials or during COVID providing things like uh, personal protection equipment, et cetera. And the second point is that it provides a safety net. So things like if the worker is sick, uh, he or she, or they, they, they still get to, uh, you know, get payments so that sickness does not become a reason for not getting paid. Same with parental leave or holiday leave, et cetera. This, the third uh, principle is on contracts. And we basically look at the contracts in consultation with legal scholars and make sure that the contracts are clearly written, first of all. Uh, we're talking about Germany. A lot of immigrant workers are in Germany, that they are translated. Uh, they're not just in German, but also at least translate into English, but also other languages that, languages that these workers may be speaking. And uh, the second point is that the contract does not include any clauses that we feel is going to harm the worker in the long run. So this could be things like liability clauses, for example. The fourth principle is about management. And here we're basically looking at whether the workers have actual physical channels, human representatives that they can send emails to call or even go to offices and meet in person if they have any questions, problems, concerns that they wanna raise uh, individually. So this is uh, the, the fourth principle. And principle 4.2, basically the second threshold makes sure that there is equity in the management process and um, uh, that all workers have, you know, get to meet the, the people, uh, the managers that they work for and they're not discriminated against in doing that. The final principle, and this is, this is something that has become huge in the last year in, in Germany and we can talk more about it in question and answer, is fair representation, so collective representation. So we are looking at here the, the possibility of workers as a group of workers, not as individuals, to be able to organize. So, you know, as an individual, when you go confront a big platform, your chances of getting, you know, your word out there, getting your voice heard might be smaller, but as a group of workers, the chances are higher. So here we're looking at basically possibilities to, for example, in the case of Germany, form works councils or possibilities to get union representation. If the platform is providing those mechanisms, is open to these kinds of methods and mechanisms of collective worker voice. This is the fifth principle that we're looking at. At the end of this, this the, the five principles, basically, as I mentioned, we have two different thresholds. We assign points based on the data that we collected, principle by principle. So one point for the first, po first point, um, the first threshold and second point for the second threshold in each principle, which uh, reaches us to a score of 10. And 10 here, I have to underline over and over again, it does not mean that this is the perfect platform. It just means that it's meeting the minimum standards of fairness in this economy. Even a 10 out of 10 platform, which we never had in the two, two and a half years of fair work research uh, in any of the countries that we've done the research so far, even a 10 out of 10 platform has a lot of things to still do to make work fair and enjoyable for the workers. So let's get to the fair work Germany part uh, uh, without uh, prolonging the process of talking about fair work as a project. So we know in, in Germany, the platform economy has become quite big in the last uh, five years or so. There are a number of studies and statistics can fail in this regard because a lot of workers do not consider the work that they do as platform work sometimes or are not including, included in these numbers or are freelancing and are not necessarily declaring or are known by statistical offices of the jobs that they do. But fairly speaking, 
We know that two and a half to three million workers in Germany earn at least a quarter of their income through platform work. So as Amel has mentioned, this includes things like ride hailing. So uh, Uber, Freenow, et cetera, or different platforms that uh, operate in different countries for ride hailing purposes. Uh, this includes platforms that offer domestic work or care work, for example. This also includes heavily, especially in Germany in the last many years, uh, delivery, food and grocery delivery platforms. Uh, and Berlin, especially uh, in Germany, but also in Europe, has become one of the centers of venture capital investments. So a lot of new companies are, uh, that operate all over Europe right now are actually based in Berlin. They have headquarters in Berlin, physical offices in Berlin. So that was also one of the reasons that we want to focus the research a bit more. On Berlin, we also included participants from other cities around Germany, but our focus, and I was physically also present in Berlin for the most part, so our focus was also in Berlin, on Berlin. And finally, as I mentioned, there have been, especially right during COVID, and I, I mean, COVID still continues, but when the pandemic was really uh, led us into lockdowns, for example, in Germany and the rest of the world, a lot of new players got in the market of delivering food and groceries. Um, so that also was a new phenomenon. There was two platforms before, and all of a sudden we had like six platforms that are operated, operating in the food and grocery delivery sector in Germany itself. And having just laid the background of what Germany, German platform economy looks like, let me just like fast forward a little and then just tell you what the key findings are from the research that we have done. And then I'm going to break these down into the principles that I mentioned before so that we get a clear understanding of how, you know, which principles work and which principles don't in the case of Germany. So in the case of Germany, the platform economy, especially in 2019 and 20, and a little bit in 20, into 2021 as well, we've seen increased competition for workers. A lot of these platforms were interested in employing a lot more workers, and they were also getting a lot of investment money. They were growing exponentially. But this did not necessarily translate into better labor standards or fair labor standards. This did not mean that workers were getting paid more in some cases or were uh, provided with, uh, with, with equipment and other task specific um, uh, things that they would need for work, for example. And secondly, we see that the working conditions depend uh, on the platforms. So some platforms, as we know, are gonna score higher and some platforms are gonna score lower because of how they treat their workers, what they offer to their workers. And in some cases, the working conditions, even within the platform, differ from you know, one warehouse to another warehouse or one building to another other building, basically, in this case. But then these are all things that we took into credit in coming up with our scores, of course. And there were some platforms that compared to last year, this was the second year of Germany research. The first year was then in 2019. I wasn't part of the Fair Work team back then. We know that some com companies are, some platforms are adopting policies, for example, with regards to collective representation, with regards to anti-discrimination policies, some also with regards to uh, regulation of working conditions are implementing fair policies, but there's still a lot more to be done. And finally, and this is the big one, this has been the theme of pretty much like all of my stay in Berlin because I've seen so many strikes, so many worker organized events, so many wildcat strikes as they're called because they're not covered legally, protected legally uh, within the German legal system. We've seen so much worker activism and we've seen platforms respond to that worker activism. We've seen a lot of, uh, many of these platforms, uh, workers uh, uh, organizing and, and, and forming worker works councils, for example, Betriebsrat as they're, they're known in, in, in German. So worker activism did matter, not just for changing policies in the platforms, but also for the politicians to open their eyes and realize there's something happening here, for the media to also open their eyes and realize that there's something happening here. And also for us researchers as well to, to, to benefit from, because that also brings us with a plethora of data basically, and also a lot of opportunities to meet workers in person and to talk to them and, uh, have a more intimate understanding of what is really going on in the platform economy. So the findings, as I said, I'm gonna break it down in principle by principle very quickly. So with regards to fair payments, when we were doing research, the minimum hourly wage was 9.60, 9 euros 60 an hour. 
after cost, that's really important to us because we know that a lot of platforms actually don't provide certain things to their workers and those things come out of the worker's pocket. So we want to make sure that these platforms provide at least 960 an hour after the costs. And most of the platforms in Germany did get this point and they, were, uh, they did provide 960 an hour. But with regards to a local living wage, which uh, we calculated as 1250, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the exact number in front of me right now. We did a calculation based on uh, some statistical office numbers, government numbers, and only two platforms, 12 that we evaluated, actually gave a local living wage to, to their workers after costs. With regards to fair conditions, this was very problematic. Many platform workers do actually work in precarious conditions. So that was a, a big problem and a lot of platforms did not get uh, the points for that. And many of the platforms also do not audit uh, the, uh, the, or are not audited regularly to ensure that the workers are working in a safe environment. And finally, um, if you're a contractual, if you're an, an employment contract in Germany, this comes as a given, but we also know a lot of platforms do not offer employment contracts to their workers. So many of the workers, do work as independent contractors or freelancers, and they do not get any of the benefits that a, a worker and employment contract gets. And that was quite problematic, especially during COVID when sickness was an everyday reality in our lives. With regards to fair contracts, uh, many of the contracts we found uh, did abide with the local uh, law, with, with the German law, national, federal law as well. And they were comprehensive and usually provided in German and English in some platforms also if they're employing a lot of, let's say, Spanish workers or uh, Spanish workers coming from Spanish speaking countries. Uh, there was also a Spanish uh, contract available. Data regulation was, this is a big thing in Germany. So most of the platforms did comply with this. They were uh, covered under GDPR, uh, the general data protection regulations. But with ride hailing platforms, uh, this became, became problematic because Ride hailing works on a different system which includes subcontracting. So you're not directly working for, let's say, Uber, but a subcontracting company. So that was a bit problematic in, in terms of what contracts workers are provided and if they're regulated by the platform itself. With regards to management, um, we have found that most platforms are, have actual physical presence in in, uh, in Germany, so they have human representatives that you can call, you can send emails to, workers know who they're working for, for the most cases. But the efficiency of this communication with the platform manage management is quite questionable, really. Uh, it, sometimes workers could send, you know, they have the availability, the possibility using their phones, the platform interface, et cetera, to be able to send questions uh, or concerns or something that happened at work that needs immediate attention but the response rate was not always great. And in some cases, they did not even get any responses. So that became a problem for certain platforms. And there was, uh, many of the platforms did not, do not take anti-discrimination policies seriously. They say that they do, but we don't see it necessarily as much in practice. So there needs to be a lot more to be done in terms of promoting um, diversity in workplace for many of these platforms. Finally, fair representation. This was a point that pretty much none of the platforms got in Germany because at the time of research, the majority of the platforms that we've evaluated did not even have works councils, which is a legal right of the workers uh, working for these platforms. Part of that also has to do with the fact that many of the workers are coming from different countries to so the idea of unionizing, organizing, or in what structure, legal structure, was still quite unknown, but um, and back in 2020, 21, uh, we've seen that uh, I'm sorry, 21 to 22, we've seen that a lot of this activism was, it was in earlier stages of development. But there was also, especially after the second half of 2021 into 2022, a lot more of worker activism and a lot of um, new form, uh, formations, a lot of new structures such as works councils forming in especially the food and grocery delivery sector. And we can get to what those are and what it was like uh, uh, observing uh, this change in, in Germany in the local context in situ, in situ, basically. So just to give you a fair idea, at the end of the research, after negotiating, after talking with uh, interviewing workers and management, we basically have these tables that we create that show the points that, uh, that the platforms get. So just to give you an example, here are two companies. Gorillas is a food, food delivery company 
Volt is a grocery, uh, I'm sorry, Gorilla is a grocery delivery company. Volt is a food delivery company. And in the case of Gorillas, maybe you be following the news happening in, you know, news in Germany. Uh, a lot of media attention has been paid to Gorillas as well. Gorillas only got a two out of 10, and those two points were for fair pay and fair contracts. So basically, they provided one, you know, they provided a local minimum wage and they provided a contract that was legible enough for the workers to understand it in two different languages. In the case of Volt, Volt got a seven because they did a better job in monitoring working conditions. They did a better job in, uh, in, 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 nego in, 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 in um, communicating with their workers, but they still did not. And to this day, they still do not have a works council. So they did not get any points for principle five, for example. So finally, a very briefly, because I know I'm running out of time, in like a minute, I'll just wrap this up. We have this pledge campaign that is open to all institutions, including the Goethe Institute. So there's an invitation that I'm extending from here as well to Goethe, um, where we, we would like to invite uh, institutions to, uh, to, to review their policies into if they are using these platforms. So this could be cleaning platforms, this could be food or grocery del del delivery platforms. If you are using one of these platforms, uh, here's an invitation for you to, to take a look at the pledge, either as a supporter or a partner. Uh, and uh, if you feel like you would like to promote uh, better working conditions uh, uh, and do that by basically um, bringing in platforms or using platforms that score higher in the fair work, through fair work research, here's an invitation to you, uh, extended to you from me on behalf of fair work to join us uh, as a supporter partner uh, in, in, this, in this campaign. So that's it. Uh, that was a very brief overview of the German research that we have done uh, in the last two years. And the rest, I'm gonna save it for question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Oz, for your presentation. And moving on, we are going to hear a presentation from Professor Cheryl Ruth Soriano. She is a professor in the Department of Communication de La Salle, University Manila. And she has published numerous works that focus on the intersection of digital cultures, marginality, and social justice. As Principal investigator for Fair Work Philippines. Her current research explores digital communications and transformations in labor and organizing in the digital economy. She is co editor of the volume Asian Perspective of Digital Culture, Emerging Phenomena, Enduring Concept, and co author of Philippine Digital Cultures, Procreate Dynamics on YouTube, that has been published by Amsterdam University Press. Prof. Soriano held visiting fellowship at the Center for Communications, Politics, and Culture at RMIT University and at the Institute of Sociology and Anthropology in Peking University. Please welcome Cheryl Soriano. Hi, good day, I'm Melinda. And terima kasih to go to Institute in Indonesia for inviting me today. Please, Cheryl, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me just uh, share my screen. All right. Can I just get a check if my audio is all fine? All right. So. Uh, again, uh, good day, everyone. Um, and following the theme of today's webinar, my talk will highlight the platform labor experience in the Philippines as that between opportunity and precarity. So today I'm speaking um, in terms of my involvement in research, ethnographic research on cloud work, uh, understanding the conditions of Filipino workers in, in cloud work for about five years now. And then over the past year in my affiliation with Fair Work as country lead for the Philippine team, I'll also be talking about the experiences of workers in on-demand work. And I'll try to blend the two together in this talk. So my uh, talk will circle around these themes. I first talk about the growing platform economy in the Philippines and also the ambivalent marginality of platform workers in a country in the global south like the Philippines. Then I speak about the labor conditions in both cloud work and on-demand work, highlighting also the research that we've done on fair work. 
then I'll circle on what are the uh, assertions of agency that we are seeing from the worker side in terms of articulating solidarity and collective voice, and then uh, end with some concluding thoughts. So it's great that Ooz has uh, given us a background of what the platform is. And uh, today I'll talk, as, as mentioned, I'll talk about two kinds. Um, one is cloud work. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, may, perhaps more of us are familiar with location-based platforms, but cloud work is a kind of a platform where um, like Upwork, a Fiverr or onlinejobs.ph that can match a worker with a client located in another part of the world, usually based in the global north. Um, there is a broad range of work on cloud work uh, that a worker can get, such as from writing to data entry, to design work, to customer service support, to games and software development, to digital marketing and even English language teaching, to the most popular kind of work among Filipinos, virtual assistants. On the right side of the screen, you will see the geographically tethered uh, or location-based services where a platform uh, matches a worker and a customer who are co-located, located in the same area. And we know this as ride healing, food and career, cleaning in the Philippines. Uh, there are sprouting platforms providing cleaning as well. Um, in both cloud work and location-based platforms, workers normally do not possess formal employee and employee relationships. Um, in, uh, in the platform, they're considered freelancers or gig workers, sometimes independent contractors. And their status as independent contractors rather than employees disqualifies them for uh, labor protections that are already provided in Philippine laws. So um, just a, a screenshot of how a cloud work platform looks like for uh, some of you who are not too familiar. Um, it's a space that matches um, a worker and a client um, for particular kinds of jobs. The Philippines is one of the largest suppliers of labor in cloud work platforms, as you can see in this chart. Um, zooming into PHL there, somewhere in the right side. So a large proportion of the work in cloud work is performed by workers in the global south, particularly in India, the Philippines, Ukraine, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And noticeable in this image um, is that while online freelancing is taken up across the globe, the nature of clients, whether local or foreign, differ, as well as the average or median rates. In the Philippines, the bright blue circle uh, around it indicates the predominance of foreign clients, meaning Filipino workers are servicing foreign clients, and the yellow inner circle implies that the median rates are at the low end. No? Uh, and with Bangladesh and Pakistan, PAK and BGD, sharing the same features. However, in the Philippine context, because of low average local wages and with our daily minimum wage only at around $10 per day, then the three to $5 median wage per hour may seem acceptable to a worker who can hustle around eight hours or more of work in a day. On the other hand, location-based platforms are also growing, catering to local demand for ride hailing, food, and last mile delivery. And as I speak now, uh, many more apparently are sprouting as local enterprises now beyond the large global platforms like Grab that have come much earlier. In the absence of official numbers, our research estimates close to half a million on-demand workers in the country. But in reality, we believe that this is more because platform workers are not normally accounted for in official statistics. So we based our estimates um, um, from for some of the data shared with us by the platforms. We also found that uh, platform labor is no longer just a source of supplementary income, but has become a major source of livelihood for many workers in the Philippines. And while this creates a boost to a struggling economy in the pandemic and more Filipinos due to choice or lack of choice are compelled to join the gig economy, we also see the challenges to the conditions that workers face. So in the Philippine context, where there is always already existing precarity and informality, how is platform labor perceived? And I wanted to highlight this background to, to, to better situate platform labor and also why it's seen as an opportunity for many Filipinos. Historically, from pushing Filipinos as migrant workers to fully embracing business process outsourcing like call center work, the government has pushed the popularity of cloud work or locally called, more popularly called, online freelancing, as well as gig work in ride hailing and delivery as a solution to unemployment. 
Statistical data in the Philippine Labor Force Survey shows around 3 million Filipinos without jobs. And this is normally an underestimate. Underemployment also remains significant, involving around 7.5 million Filipinos who take on multiple kinds of jobs. In the Philippines, a formal employment relationship is also not always the norm. The informal sector constitutes a big portion of the country's labor force, with around 15 million participating in vulnerable forms of employment. For cloud work, Filipino platform workers have been incorporated in the national government's push for what we call world-class service workers and modern heroes who bring in much needed jobs and foreign currency into the country. Many online freelancers we talked to moved from the drudgery of night shifts in call center work or have chosen to return home from the drudgery of doing migrant labor work to be with their families. On the other hand, ride hailing and food delivery uh, um, is seen as a, an opportunity for some workers, especially those displaced during the pandemic. For motor bike ride hailing, it expanded and somewhat modernized an already existing labor. I think you might have this in Indonesia experience riding it. We call it the habal habal, no? a system where motorcycle drivers would hitch passengers or do food deliveries for small restaurants for personally negotiated rates. It's the rider who negotiates the rates with a, a passenger. But as it expanded in the metropolis, it expanded clientele to include middle class workers in the city needing to navigate through traffic gridlocks. Thus, gig work um, is sometimes seen as a step up for some of the informal workers, such as habal habal riders, pedicab riders, or tricycle riders. And this labor, broader labor condition in the Philippines is further pushed by discourses of entrepreneurialism or flexibility, distinction, and heroism that is pushed by platforms and also by government. Um, I'll talk about them quickly, no? one by one. So platforms, also government, use multiple signs. Some of them used to attract workers into this economy. They communicate to workers that they own their time. They are free to use their own resources and can earn as much as they want, depending on how much time and energy they are willing to invest. Of course, from the data that I will show later, um, actual data uh, disproves this. But as intermediary agents between workers and clients, they are imbued with a lot of power to determine the rules of interaction and therefore embed politics and control in labor management in many ways. The second one is the trope of distinction. No? This pertains to the perceived exceptionality of Filipinos when it came to global skilled work because of their trade skills on service orientedness and English proficiency. So cloud workers particularly situated themselves with a long history of Filipinos who are fulfilling labor shortages throughout the world as nurses and domestic workers, as seafarers, cooks and cleaners. And this is predominantly constructed as a natural global order of things that Filipinos should accede to and benefit from. This is how the government frames it for Filipinos. Thus, articulating the characteristics of distinction enables the nation branding of Filipino online freelancers as valuable and competitive world-class workers. However, it constructs Filipino subjects as a global commodity and a colonized subject. Connected to this is the identification of gig workers drivers and delivery riders, you can see the photo on the, uh, on the bottom down right side, uh, as more advanced and modernized than their car counterparts like jeepney drivers or taxi drivers or hubble hubble riders because they work with technology and apps. The attractiveness of the nature of work is conveyed through multiple signs, sometimes using the celebrities as signifier despite, despite how far their realities might be from the actual worker experience. And the last trope um, in the pandemic context, especially, we can see the uh, articulation of modern day heroes or the hero trope to, to, to platform workers. It is interesting how press releases on riders as real superheroes on the road surfaced after the controversial issue of a platform's poor management and behind workers' sudden protest activity. But these mechanisms essentially do not just work for the riders alone, they work to normalize the acceptability of on-demand work and our understanding of it as a viable, decent, and even altruistic work opportunity for Filipinos that does not need questioning. For cloud work, 
under the same trope of heroes, the label of modern heroes and world-class workers that have been previously attributed to overseas Filipino workers, Filipinos who go overseas to work, are being gradually conferred on online freelance workers too. They were thought to be now OFW 2.0, no longer overseas Filipino workers, but now online freelance worker. This was because through digital labor, one still earns dollars and performs as a global worker, only this time without having to be away from home. But in reality, whether we look at cloud work or on-demand work, there is a ton, a list of challenges that workers face. Uh, and, and when I juxtapose them side by side, there is some variability, but essentially um, they seem to be parallel. First is the issue of variable pay and the lack of social security benefits, particularly for on-demand workers who have spoken to us. They complain about opaque pay structures. They don't know how their pays are actually calculated. Of course, coupled with that is the lack of other forms of social security benefits. In cloud work, workers assume significant costs. They buy their own laptops and paraphernalia. They pay for their own electricity, their own workspace at the home, um, including the payment transaction costs. When the client is going to pay them, they often assume that cost. And on the other hand, for on-demand workers, they, of course, pay for fuel, um, supplies, uh, internet data connectivity costs, and sometimes vehicle repayments as well. And as Uz mentioned, in the case of Germany, there are no safety nets, and in, in more so in platforms operating in the Philippines. So both this operates both in cloud work, although in the context of cloud work, some workers are able to negotiate some sick pay, but this time more directly with clients, and depending on whether clients would actually choose to give them after building some form of trust with the clients over a period of time of work. Common to both kinds of platform workers is labor seasonality. Um, it's hard to de depend on the platform because there will be times that there's a lot of work, but there will be seasons when they cannot find work at all. And as we have seen in the context of the pandemic, especially for on-demand workers and ride healing, many of the workers we talked to, um, their cars had been taken away from them because they could no longer sustain the uh, monthly amortization or contributions, um, believing in the promises of this work, but no longer could sustain the payment of the cars. And then both are exposed to risks. Cloud workers are exposed to scams, meaning, for example, designers who have done the design, but ending up not getting paid by the client. Some platforms have safeguards for this, others don't. On the other hand, on-demand workers are exposed to tons of risks, illnesses, injuries, accidents, and also scams, wherein someone would order a bulk of delivery. Not only is the worker unpaid for that delivery, that is by a scammer, the worker now has to pay for the food that that scammer ordered because the platform will not pay or cover for that scam uh, 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 delivery. Cloud workers have also spoken to us. Um, some of them would uh, lament the lack of career progression because some of the design work or some of the uh, other kinds of jobs that they perform, they could not put them necessarily in the CVs. Um, or they would lament that um, they feel like uh, uh, in, in comparison to uh, their previous work where they can see very clear progression, this one, they're not quite sure how they could build their skills. Others who are more entrepreneurial are able to do so. On the bottom are less uh, kind of less tangible kinds of, of, of challenges. Um, so common promise of platform labor is flexibility, both for cloud work and also for on-demand work. But for cloud work in reality, workers lament the false control over time and strict work management because they work under time monitoring apps because they're paid because many of them are paid per hour. So the the the, the work uh, uh, softwares have embedded in them time monitoring apps, so they need to work and move their mouse so that, that the other side would know that they are working. And the same goes for on-demand work. Um, workers talk to us that uh, there are monitoring um, uh, uh, systems embedded in the app that tracks their location, the paths that they take, when they are not taking rides, and so on and so forth. 
there's also the issue of impersonal management in the sense that when they have complaints or they have questions about the calculations of their rates, um, they have to talk to a chat support system. Some chat support systems work better than others, but others kind of are, 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 are non-human interactions that makes it very difficult for them to articulate their concerns. And finally, for cloud workers, um, I'm not saying that this is not an issue for on-demand workers. It's just that the workers we talked to did not particularly highlight that. But dissatisfaction and lack of meaning in work was prominent for some of the cloud workers. Um, one, one, one feature of this is where sometimes they are, upon entering into a contract, suddenly they will get to have to do work that kind of violates as a, a, what they will be prepared to do. So some of, uh, some of them would share to us that they are suddenly forced to do black hat strategies or other kinds of things that they did not anticipate that they actually have to do. So now I wanted to highlight a little bit more about what we have found from the Fair Work Philippines ratings. And again, our Fair Work Philippines study focused more on geographically tethered um, apps you know, and the labor that is uh, uh, done here and the conditions of workers there. So of the nine platforms that we studied in the Philippines, uh, and sadly, only four of them scored any points. Um, so in, in, in this uh, league table, uh, there are three that are ride hailing. That's grab car for four wheels and Ancas and Joyride are two wheels or motorbike taxi. Uh, and then all the rest are food and uh, last mile delivery. Just to uh, zoom in a little bit more on the scores in terms of the principles of, of fairness that uh, Oz uh, spoke about earlier, I wanted to highlight that the platforms that achieved scores achieved scores only for the basic point, the, the first point on fair conditions, fair contracts, and fair representation. So four of nine platforms achieved scores for fair conditions, meaning they had mechanisms to mitigate task-specific risks. There were also uh, platforms that scored for fair contracts and fair management. But again, five of nine platforms did not score any points there. And Importantly, in terms of fair pay, no platform could evidence guaranteeing that workers earn above the daily minimum wage after costs um, uh, of approximately 10 US dollars. As I mentioned, workers also talked to us about the block box of rate calculations. They are not quite sure how their rates are calculated and how it appears that it suddenly sometimes, no, the per kilometer rate suddenly goes down or, um, uh, uh, at a certain point in time. There is importantly unpaid labor time. Um, it's not just the labor time of waiting for a gig to come, but it's also the, the waiting time for food to be packed no? or, or deliveries to be packed or for, for customers to come down. So all of these are unpaid no? in the context of, of, of their work. Um, one thing that I wanted to highlight is that lured by the opportunities and promises of the platform economy, some workers are compelled to invest in a car, sometimes a motorbike or a mobile device. They would borrow money from money lenders or go for loans in the assumption that they would be able to recuperate this. Some also pay contractors no? under a subcontracting agreement. So due to these arrangements, including the vehicle or mobile device repayments that they make, but plus all of the rest of the costs that they shoulder on their own, they are barely able to take home the minimum wage after costs are taken out. So initially it might seem that they are earning okay, but at the gross level, but when you deduct all the things that they have to pay, they fall into highly vulnerable conditions. The next one that I wanted to highlight is that um, although they brand platform workers as freelancers who can work their own time whenever they want, in and in reality, you no, know, in and in, in the absence of regulation, different delivery platforms insidiously dictate working conditions and the conduct and compliance with work guidelines. One platform, for example, uses a batching system for its writers: batch one, two, three, and four, up to six. Putting the worker in a particular batch significantly influences the base rate that the worker gets for each transaction, and also the likelihood that the worker would be prioritized for future deliveries. How are workers placed in batches? Well, 
There are criteria, whether they are able to perform at par with recommended guidelines of good performance, such as not canceling rides, working for a recommended number of hours during peak times, and days, as you can see in the slide. There are many more mechanisms that dictate control, and the other one that's indirect control is that platforms can hire as many workers as they want without control, which also affects workers' wait times. This creates a race for many workers to deliver work in the best way that they can to accept any rights thrown at them because amid this hyper competition, they know that they are easily dispensable. And then lastly, what I wanted to highlight is that as individuals, writers may feel intimidated to raise concerns or complaints. So workers attempt to come together to articulate the, their concerns. However, there can be sanctions that workers face when they collectively organize, as, is, as in this example. So again, because they are seen to be independent contractors, platforms sometimes penalize them when they come together to protest. This is what happened in the case of Food Panda writers who came together and the platform chose to attend to their concerns individually. Uh, thankfully, the, the Philippine National Labor Relations Commission ruled against the platform and for the workers. However, the situation is currently appealable under our Supreme Court. And I understand that the platform um, uh, has apparently uh, um, been talking to consider uh, uh, appealing the situation. So I move now to the last part of my presentation, which is to highlight also that workers are not facing this um, passively. Um, as more efforts from various sectors highlight these precarious conditions, workers are starting to get more and more emboldened to express collective voice. It was not the case, in fact, when we started this research two years ago for um, 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 ride hailing and food delivery. Before, it was mostly Facebook groups of workers trying to exchange strategies for self-help and platform workarounds on these Facebook groups, the photo on the left. Now, more independent collective bodies of workers are, uh, are sprouting. Uh, in fact, the photo on the right, delivers, Delivery Riders Unite, so uh, Centro of Gig Workers, uh, a, a union, was launched just last night, no? uh, which was quite exciting uh, a time for labor organizing amongst the gig workers. Now for cloud workers, there is no union and no uh, 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 sprouting formations of a union, but there are many uh, ways by which workers are coming together so to support each other. Albeit, we call this entrepreneurial solidarities. Workers come together in Facebook groups to share strategies on how to navigate the ambiguities of the cloud work platform economy. They share aspirational stories and visualizations of success, sometimes driven by influencer workers uh, in the platforms, and these create norms and standards of value. There's also a, um, a recently listed um, workers cooperative, but they essentially work in the same way. They help workers um, um, navigate through the, the platform labor economy as opposed to directly challenging you know, the, the, the abusive conditions of the platform economy. So I'll close with a few concluding thoughts. Um, so the ambivalent marginality of platform workers in the Philippine labor economy um, shows that platform labor presents an opportunity for workers with no better options. And it highlights the need to look outside and in the bigger context of, of the labor economy or the conditions in the Philippines, which makes platform labor, despite its onerous conditions for workers, palatable for workers. And this is further pushed by discourses that construct platform labor as flexible, distinctive, modern, and heroic. And government has to balance its, uh, uh, its attention to promoting platforms vis-a-vis -vis pushing for greater safeguards by platforms towards the protection of workers. So in, in this uh, uh, vulnerabilities in the labor, local labor economy, platforms capitalize on it and enact veiled controls while providing limited social safeguards and accountabilities. And finally, workers articulate nonetheless agency strategies of negotiation and collective voice as a result of their intent to survive and thrive. It's not out of the benevolence of platforms, it's amid the absence of these social protections and safeguards that, uh, that are not provided to them by government or the better platforms. And so, uh, 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 again, echoing was what Ooze was saying earlier, it needs no, 
uh, civil society support to supplement workers' efforts to organize um, and to exert greater pressure towards platforms and the government to act towards promoting fairer and decent conditions for workers. I'll end here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for the insightful presentation. See you later on the Q&A session. Okay, everyone. Uh, our last speaker is Suci Lestari Yuana from Indonesia. Uh, Bu Yuana is a lecturer at the Department of International Relations, Universitas Kajamada, Indonesia. Currently, she is pursuing her doctoral degree in the Copernicus Institute of Sustainable Development in Utrecht University. Uh, her research focused on the sociopolitical dynamic of digital platforms and its impact to sustainability transition studies. She has published papers and book chapters in national and international journal, mainly discussing about the politics of digital platforms in developing economics. In April 2022, her work has been referred in the MIT Technology Review as part of AI Colonialism Series Reportage. Please welcome Ibu Yuana. Selamat sore, Ibu Yuana. How are you? Sore, I'm Melinda. Alhamdulillah, sehat. Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here. Okay, Ibu Yuana. Uh, please continue. Please start the presentation. Good luck. Okay, so... In anticipating my bad internet connections and to keep the time efficient, uh, I will share a video where I have recorded my uh, presentations here. So, Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me in this great opportunity to discuss about the platform economy and the future of work. Well, here uh, I will share my reflections on the Indonesian experience over more than five years of working in this topic. Well, in this picture, you can see there is a man who looks tired, overworked while doing his job as a delivery guy or as um, riders of online taxis in Indonesia. And I think this picture could represent the worst scenario of the future of work in the platform economy. Why I chose this picture to begin my discussions? It's because I think everyone would enjoy a good future scenario. But if we can embrace the worst scenario and take into account what will be the risk of the future, we can be more prepared for anything that will happen in the future. So in this talk, I will share three points. First one, what makes me optimistic about the platform economy in Indonesia? And the second, what makes me pessimistic about it? And the third one, what do I think about the future of work in the platform economy in Indonesia? Well, the first point is that what makes me optimistic about it is throughout working in this topic for the more than five years, I observe that the trend of digitalization in the platform economy in Indonesia has successfully scaled up the informal economy in Indonesia. And these trends, I think, could bring more uh, progressive and important uh, impact into the social and economic development in Indonesia. Well, if we in Indonesia, informal economy, or now the gig economy, if we understand gig economy as a service from a door to door service, I would say that this kind of gig economy has long been existed for decades in Indonesia. And now the, the introductions of digital platform has somehow scaled up the way the service is being uh, operated from motorbike taxis, from grocery shoppings, from waste collections, or even from cleaning services. And this kind of scaling up uh, the informal economy has also been globally recognized quite recently by the Queen Maxima of 
the Netherlands, who gave her remarks in the G20 side events at 30 October 2021. In her remarks, she said that Indonesia is one of the inspiring examples on how digital platform can uh, improve the financial inclusions for small medium enterprise. In her remarks, she mentioned Gojek as a right hailing app, which used digital ecosystem to help small business to digitize their inventory management, marketing, payment, credit, and sales. And now suddenly these small medium enterprises are connected to a larger world, and many of them become leap forward and expand their business beyond their brick and mortar presence. Another example on how um, uh, the optimizations, uh, or how I feel optimistic about Indonesia's platform economy is from the number of mobile internet users in Indonesia. If we look at it from 2017 until 2020, we have in 2020, we have at least 176 million of mobile internet users, which is a very large uh, numbers for uh, mobile internet user. And from this amount, 81% of mobile internet subscribers have adopted digital payment via mobile wallets as of May 2021. And this adoption is higher than in other countries in the region, such as Singapore, Vietnam, and the Philippines. And if we look at from the investment sectors, according to a research by Google Temasek Bain Company in 2021, the investment value of Indonesian digital economy during the first quarter of 2021 was 4.7 billion US dollars. And this number has exceed the highest value for the last four years. This achievement makes Indonesia the most popular investment destination in Southeast Asia, even surpassing the Singapore as the neighboring countries. So what, this, uh, this kind of achievement of platform economy in Indonesia makes me very optimistic about the futures uh, of platform economies and also futures of work in Indonesia. But of course, this story is not a fairy tale story. There are also some weaknesses, challenges, limitations that Indonesians uh, in Indonesia happen. And that leads me into my second point, what makes me pessimistic about it. <clears throat> of course, there are many um, critics, uh, concerns about the platform economy in Indonesia, even from economic, social sector, political sectors, etc. But one thing that makes me very concerned, and I think it's of informal workers in the digital ecosystem. And I think this argument is also has been resonated with, with a lot of uh, research that has been uh, conducted in Indonesia. One research, for example, is from Frey in 2020, in which uh, it says that the, there is a wave of informalization of job brought by this platform economy globally but she mentions that uh in what makes it very specific in indonesia or in the near south is that this kind of workforce who live in precarious condition and unprotected world has been uh, has long been the norm in indonesia even long before the platform economy existed so what does it mean I think it means that the the introductions of platform economy could worsening the precarious and unprotected working conditions of the informal workers in Indonesia. And I'm not trying to make it more scary, but the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, has even uh, bring more detrimental effect toward the working conditions of informal workers in Indonesia. According to data from uh, Bureau of uh, Central Bureau of Statistics of Indonesia, 
during the COVID-19 in 2020, at least there is 3.84% of population quit their job because of the pandemic. And it's also resonated with the data on how the numbers of informal workers from 2019 to 2020 is increasing from 70 million into 75 million, while the total workforce in Indonesia in that year is around 135 million. So it's almost more than half population working in informal economy. And if we don't do anything to try to, in, uh, to, try to improve the conditions of informal worker or trying to increase the mobility, the vertical mobility of informal worker, this will become the biggest homework for Indonesia uh, labors uh, uh, and also workforce. A report from Fair Work Indonesia in 2021 also shares similar um, working conditions on how uh, platform workers' working condition is not really good in Indonesia. If we look at from the score, most of the platform has less or at least five to less score from the Fair Work report that also include a very long hours uh, per week and in average 70 to 100 uh, hours a week, no fair contract, no fair representations uh, for the workers' organization, only uh, less communications policy and also less protections worker policies. So and uh, despite all of this, um, working conditions of platform workers that I think I also found there is a misleading strategies shared mostly by this platform company. What kind of strategies? I found that usually most of company will advertise their platform job by using the how many income they will get per month. And usually this income will be a, will quite big income in compared to the formal work. Like for example, Gojek compare a uh, Gojek over ten million rupiah per month in two thousand fifteen, and also Octopus, which is a platform company in waste collectors, also uh, advertised that if you work in our company, you will get at least ten million rupiah per month. And quite recently, Air Asia also do similar advertisement. And what is actually misleading into this advertisement is that this advertisement not only attract the informal workers but it also attracts the non-informal workers who wants to have a, a steady income, who wants to have a bigger income, like the 10 million uh, rupiah per month. So that did make that, it makes a more difficult competitions for informal workers to enter the platform workforce, especially those uh, group of informal workers who don't have access to mobile phone, who don't have access to the internet, who don't know how to operate the digital platform, this group become very vulnerable and will most, li most likely they will be neglected in the platform workforce. And I think um, this also resonates with my current uh, research and publications about the conditions of drivers or uh, on, of online taxi where during my interview i found this metaphor of drug addictions uh, metaphor so in the interview i tried to ask how do they feel about their working conditions and one of the representations of uh, drivers told me that their life is looks like a drug uh, like they having this drug addictions why because at the beginning they have this higher income based on the bonus and everything and then they decided to change their job of online taxi from part-time to full-time so now they they depend on all of their income from this online taxis but as you can see in the interview, he said that first we got comfortable, but over time, the dose or the bonus of becoming online taxi drivers added juice, and we become addicted and dependent. So now this is our main income, and we don't have many exit options. So I think if we keep 
doing the same business as usual in the platform economy, this drug addiction metaphor will inevitably become one of most likely future scenario of the future uh, of work in the platform economy. So now I'm talking a lot about futures scenario. I'm going to my th third points is on the future of work. What do I think about this future of work? Well, I would like to share my ongoing project in my PhD studies, uh, where we're trying to find a way to have a more collective imaginary about the future of work. Because personally, I think, uh, when we discuss about how or uh, what is desirable future of on um, platform economy, it is not fair to only uh, hear, to only listen to those powerful actors and technology company to determine the future of work. I think we also need to embrace to listen any stakeholders in the platform economy and take into account their imaginaries to shape the future of work. So what do we do? Here we have three possible scenario of online taxi in Indonesia, which is the transformation where in the next 10 years, we imagine that online taxi will become the main uh, services in Indonesia where people use it every day for daily use. And then the second, uh, uh, scenario this optimization where we imagine that the online taxi service will exist hand in hand with the public transport services so online taxi services will only function as feeders or the first and last mile commute and the third scenario is on decentralizations where we imagine that there will be more uh, local actors growing in Indonesia where the the local government act as the supporter for, for these uh, local players. So we offer these three different scenario to each of the stakeholder, which is the policy makers, the, the driver organizations, the user organization, as well as the expert in digital economy and expert in transportation. And we ask them how pessimistic they are to each of the scenario and how optimistic they are to each of the scenario. And the result that we found is that uh, from the three scenarios that we offer, they feel most optimistic to the optimization scenario, which is on the middle. But if we look at the length of the bar, uh, it's uh, the length of the bar represents the level of uncertainty. So what we can see here is that in, in general, the stakeholder mo feel most optimistic with the scenario of optimization, but they also still have high level of uncertainty toward the future uh, of these optimization scenarios. And another finding we also found that there are four different uh, future scenario because during the interview, we also trying to invite our respondent to give another uh, future scenario that they think will happen in the future, which is these four scenarios are technology leapfrogging, autonomous vehicle, Jakarta as the pilot for innovations, and the uh, online taxi as the substitution. And what also uh, another important finding that we found is that talking about the future of work, we also need to unpack what makes uh, the scenario of optimization become uncertain for all of our stakeholders. So what we found is we're trying to unpack the criteria that they think will somehow shape the future of platform economy in Indonesia. Here we found 19 criteria that we categorize into four sectors, which is in economic sector, the government regulation, social, and technology. These 19 criteria is actually resonate a lot with the current debate that is going on about the future of platform economy or debate about the online taxis in, in specific. Like, for example, take into account the category in social, the criteria of labor exploitation, health, pensions, insurance, driver organization, consumer organizations, gender empowerment are actually similar with the current protests 
uh, that is still that is going on uh, by uh, and driven by the driver organization. These criteria are actually uh, the criteria that they demand the government to take into account and make policy to improve these conditions. So, well, what I also interesting that I found is during our interview, it's quite interesting to see from policymakers, for example, there are zero social criteria that become, how to say, a price, uh, a, a factor of appraisal for the policymakers. And for drivers and users, there is no criteria from technology sector, which means that for society, for drivers, for users, community, discussing about economic impact, social impact, and how the government regulations protect their right is much more important rather than discussing the future of technology itself. I have so many things to discuss, uh, so many insights. Uh, actually from this finding and I would love to discuss it with you later on on question and answer but I would like to close my talks today by talking about by by taking uh, into account what I wrote in my ongoing project about the futures imaginary. My current conclusions shows that how the future imaginaries are never purely about particular technology but more about value and expectation of the that technology to fulfill. And in my study case, in our study case in Indonesia shows how the non-technological aspect are more prominent than the technical aspect in the articulated social technical imaginaries. Thank you for your attentions and looking forward for having a fruitful discussions with you. Thank you so much, Ibu Yuana, for the insightful presentation. And now I want to invite Owus and Cheryl back to the screen because uh, the Q&A session is about to begin. Okay. Hello again, uh, Cheryl and Owus. Okay, uh, we already have uh, some questions from our participants, but I would like to start this Q&A session uh, with my own question. If, uh, so I've been wondering, is there any connection between identity and how, how, like, how does, uh, should we be concerned uh, that certain identity or certain group or of people are going to disproportionately affected by the working the poor working conditions under a platform economy or is the system like blind towards identity so everyone could be the victim and everyone could be oppressed in the same amount of oppression is there any of you want to answer the question first i i can take a first stab at it um okay. the the system the pla the economy itself actually accentuates it actually highlights even further the structural uh discrimination that is in place in many of the many of the countries in all of the countries that we basically look at so if there are there is, for example, if racism is an issue and racism is an issue in mm -hmm. every society, it's something that we battle, we battle as communities, we battle as activists, etc. but it still stays, right? Racism, xenophobia, um, based on, you know, your gender could be one. Um, it's not that uh, the platforms actively promote discrimination. Platforms mm -hmm. actually in most cases, try to implement policies, or if they don't have any, through discussions with fair work researchers, they try to come up with these anti-discrimination policies, and not just as a policy, as a statement saying, we as a platform don't discriminate. You know, that's not what we want to see. We want to see actual mm -hmm. policies, the policy in practice of the platform trying to do something. And of course, we understand a single platform is not going to be able to change an entire um, you know, 
ideology or an entire attitude that's endemic to uh, to society that's structural itself. But we also expect these platforms to take at least a stab at it. And, you know, because they are an important part of the economy, they employ a lot of people, they interact with a lot of customers. So this did become quite an issue um, in, in Germany, but also in other contexts as well for us where uh, talking especially to workers with uh, that are coming from other countries that for example may not be speaking good good German if any German at all because it is not necessarily a criteria to be employed by some of these platforms that may have um, you know based on their religion or the way they identify themselves that may dress differently that may have head scars, turbans, you know, that, you know, based on, um, as I said, their religion or their, um, their um, how they identify themselves and, or simply based on how they look, you know, where they come from, in which, which, can, which can be an identifier for being different. So, you know, a lot of these platform workers are engaging with society on a constant daily basis. They are out on the streets. They are very visible. They are going into private spaces of people's homes to clean, for example, or to deliver food. So this does become an issue. And this is something that as Fair Work, we are taking very seriously uh, and pushing platforms, as I said, as I mentioned before, to implement policies to at least become a part of, you know, a, a vehicle for changing uh, these things that, uh, that we don't want to see in our societies. Thank you, Oz, for your response. Uh, if you want or Cheryl, you may want to add something to that. Okay, we Cheryl. All yeah. right, yeah. Uh, accentuating biases and also reinforcing societal biases generally. And um, I guess this is why uh, th this uh, idea of fair management in the fair work um, principles emphasizes this point um, uh, there, no? particularly because um, marginalized groups are likely to get further discriminated within these conditions. So we ask the question of whether platforms actively institute mechanisms to make it less likely for these already existing marginalized groups to get further marginalized whether by virtue of algorithmic management systems, how workers are matched with workers, or how they are deprivileged from getting matched, or by the mechanisms by which they are protected, say from traveling at night, or by how they are treated by the worker. So we look at this and it's very well incorporated in, um, in, the, in the principles that we try to advance for platforms to uphold. In the context of cloud work, I guess one of the mechanisms by, where these biases will be more apparent is how workers from the global South who might be thinking that this is the kinds of rates that they deserve, may be pulling down the rates even as they can bid for them. And so uh, again, as, as, a, as a push by fair work um, is to set wage floors so that kind of to, to, to lessen the possibilities that workers who think, oh, one dollar per, per hour is okay with me, is kind of to avoid that. And, and the clients who will take advantage of those um, of workers who are bidding for very low rates. So some platforms are acting on it, but some platforms are Okay, thank you, Cheryl. It seems that uh, Buyana want to share some thought on these questions. Okay. Yes, uh, I think I agree with Ous and also Cheryl uh, on how actually this uh, digital platform are hierarchy in natures, which means their system is not egalitarian, is not uh, equal treating uh, people who are working in in the system. Why I say that? Because, uh, for example, if, if, they, if we look at how the algorithmic matching work, they don't actually identify who has digital skill, who can understand how to operate uh, mobile phones or not. So I think one discrimination that automatically happens in the system is to divide those who understand uh, digital technology and those who understand it. And in the context of Indonesia, I think it affects a lot of informal workers. It affects a lot of groups, group of informal workers who are vulnerable in understanding of digital skills. And I think, uh, of course, the movement to improve uh, the awareness of, of this digital skill is important to do, but I think we also need a more proactive uh, programs from the platform itself to include this vulnerable group, how 
how to make them more um, accept, uh, accepted in the platform. Thank you, Bu Yoana, for the answer. Uh, now let's move on to the questions that have been asked by our participants. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm going to read the question from Saskia. Uh, her question is, in the favorite project itself, has there any research that explores the opportunity of decentralized autonomous organizations in platform economy? Because she would love to connect and explore possibilities to partner with Fair Work uh, because as she's currently building platform as well. So maybe this uh, question would be directed to Oz and also Cheryl. As far as I know, no, we don't have, uh, but then again, I am uh, mostly focused on what we call the geographically tethered platforms and not cloud work platforms. So I know that uh, a lot of DCO, D DACs actually um, employ like free, uh, freelancing that work on freelancing models for, uh, for maybe cloud work. So maybe that might be more relevant for the cloud work researchers. But as far as I know, not, no. <laughs> Uh, Bu Cheryl, do you want to add something mm. to that? Yeah, not, not in the capacity of my research with Fair Work and also our research on cloud work focused more on ethnographically understanding the conditions of workers. But yeah, uh, it's true, the emergence of DAOs would be very interesting. Um, we have seen some community-led organizations, not particularly raising themselves as DAOs for that matter, but we have seen some former workers who have come together to set up platform co-ops but unfortunately they didn't get any sustainability they had to shut down especially during the pandemic but that would have been a promising sample of an organization on cloud work huh? they were a locally based establishing a locally based cl cloud work platform unfortunately they, they could not sustain themselves okay thank you Cheryl and Oz uh Saskia also oh yeah, Oz, you want to add something? I was just gonna add, I was just gonna add something real quick. Um, I mean, there are platform co-ops we look at, uh, but platform co-ops I think are something different than these decentralized autonomous organizations, which are kind of a new phenomenon itself. Like they are actually a product, as far as I know, and I know very little about them. So please take it with a grain of salt. What I know is that they, they actually work on like the, the Bitcoin markets, like they're, they're sort of like an offshoot of that. And that's like the new way of organ, organizing workplace that is uh, that's, that works on its own algorithm and not so different from the platforms we look at because they also work on algorithms. But the, uh, as far as I know, like worker cops we look at, but DAC is not exactly enough. Okay then. Uh, Saskia also has another follow-up question. It's still for uh, Cheryl and Oz. The question is how Fair Work Foundation take into account the platform's customer, uh, sorry, the platform's customer demand that impacted the fairness that can be provided by the platform. I guess I'll go first again, and uh, it seems like that's like kind of become the norm here. Um, so we actually, this is a very good question because it's, you, you're going to see a lot of platforms that come to us and say, but we don't, you know, this is not our responsibility. We are just a marketplace. We're just there, you know, making sure that the customer and the worker has a platform to, to reach each other and then do their business, right? And this is this this is not something that we uh, buy into because it's the platform's responsibility to also supervise this relationship, not just simply throw the worker at the mercy of the customer. In this case, uh, this happens quite often with like domestic work platforms, for example, which mostly work on freelancing models, and they, uh, at least in Germany, we see that they present themselves as basically a market place where you know like an ebay kind of place where there's a buyer and a seller and then whatever happens there happens there you know we're not going to take any responsibility kind of that's not correct because at the end of the day the worker is using that platform to reach out to that to that customer and if something goes wrong in that relationship between the customer 
then the worker, like who is the worker going to go to? Uh, it should be the platform that is the first respondent in that case, right? If, the, for example, the worker does not get the money that he, uh, they were promised, or if the worker has a bad experience working with that customer, is treated wrongly, etc. Uh, of course, the, you know, there's, there can be other legal steps that are taken if the situation is serious, but it should be the platform that provides also these, um, uh, these uh, services uh, to, to, the, uh, to, the, to the worker uh, so that the worker knows which steps to follow and whom to uh, address their concern, concerns to basically. Thank you, Oz. Cheryl? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question um, precisely, but what I'd say is that um, platforms will not exist without customers that buy the work or clients that, that buy the work. And um, the Fair Work Pledge that was uh, um, shown earlier um, highlights how a pressure on business organizations that might contract platforms, say, for example, my university, because we have been in the pandemic, they, my university sends out food coupons using platform coupons to give us our, our uh, meeting food, for example. So many organizations tap into these platforms. And if we advance the idea that customers should be working with platforms that are advancing fairer conditions for their workers. Um, I, I guess that's where uh, fair work factors in that prominently, um, uh, creating a space where uh, the, broader econ the, the, the broader society could get to buy in to supporting um, um, fairer conditions for workers and uh, supporting platforms that advance those conditions more than others. Thank you, Cheryl, for the response. Uh, the next question is for Bu Yuliana. Bu Yuana. Uh, let me, okay. Uh, the question is from Cheryl Malidi. He asked, uh, it seems that there will be consequences of the optimization of platform facilitated service and future vision under smart cities idea as there will be less need for formal work. When the formal work mode cannot absorb excess labor, informal platform-based work will emerge as a solution. Are there any other ways to deal with the employment in your opinion, Buyuana? Okay, thank you, uh, Khairul Maulidi for the questions. I think uh, in case of unemployment, informal jobs become would be become the safety net for anyone, not only the informal workers, but also formal workers who lost their job. And uh, I think that the safety net, uh, what do we what, what do they do after that is to take this uh, informal job like becoming a motorbike taxi drivers or uh, opening small medium enterprise, et cetera. But I think in those mechanisms, there is unfairness existed. What kind of unfairness? One thing for sure is there is an inequality of mobility between workers. So it is easier for formal workers, for people who already have a university degree, to choose whether they want to work in the formal job or informal job. They, can, they have those two options, but it is not possible for worker who doesn't have a university degree, who maybe only have an elementary school degree to choose a formal jobs. And I think that's our problem that we need to fix. What we need to fix is how can we make this for vertical mobility more fluid? How can we give more options for people who only have an options in informal work, who, for people who only have um, degree in elementary school, to also have an option to ha get a job in a formal work. And I think there is a uh, many way to do that. And one possible way to do that is actually by utilizing the data that in the plat uh, that already exists in the platform applications. For example, a motorbike uh, driver in Gojek or in Grab, 
every day they doing their order they actually collecting data for themselves they collecting data of how many order they conducted per day they collecting data how many income they get per day they collecting data of the ratings of the review from the customers and actually i think these kind of data can you can be utilized for the sake of the worker itself this kind of data can be utilized as for example as a cv for the worker to apply for a formal job. And that is something we don't have in Indonesia right now. This is something that uh, me and my team are initially trying to do. And I think that could be an option to increase the fluidity of vertical mobility of informal workers. Thank you, Brian, Buyana, for the answer. Okay, next uh, we have Dian Fatmawati here, who is wondering, uh, from the Fairwork survey that has been done, uh, which country that has on average the highest rating score? And comparing Germany and Philippines, uh, is Germany's score higher than the Philippines? Or maybe it's the other way around. Could you, uh, Cheryl and Oz, please uh, help me answering this question? Uh, I guess just a, a quick word of caution that the scores are not always easily comparable, um, especially because um, some of the principles and the specific operationalization of the principles change over the years. So um, uh, one country score uh, uh, needs to be taken uh, uh, with caution in comparing it to another country's um, score. Um, um, but having said this, um, uh, I can see that Oz um, replied to the question uh, on the chat, no? and I agree that um, I guess pressure uh, by way of government regulation might matter in, in a sense or low, uh, uh, governmental policies that may have an impact on uh, pressuring platforms to do something better might be a factor here. So for example, uh, I will not name the platform, but there's a platform that offers or provides sick pay for up to 180 days within Southeast Asia, another Southeast Asian country. But that same benefit is not available in the Philippines. And I was asking, why is that? Um, well, we found that out uh, in the course of the research. We have no clear answers to that. But certainly, it could be that there is greater pressure for platforms operating in that country to give that benefit, as opposed to the Philippines, where particularly labor loss in relation to the gig economy is kind of <laughs> behind, no? in catching up. Yeah, as, as, as Cheryl has uh, rightly put it, um, it really depends on the country context. The principles are this, I mean, the principles change every year we have meetings every year where we discuss the principles as a whole team of 30 countries all coming together because the principles are the way they apply the way they are operationalized in each country depends on the country context uh, of course we're still looking at the same principles here we're still looking at the same criteria but their interpretation to some extent is left to the country teams but, you know, as I said, the country context matters also within the case of the legal context. In some countries, the, the local minimum wage is so low that, you know, no one can, you know, make a living on such a low uh, minimum wage. You know, in the case of Germany, it's still low. If you, uh, you know, ask people, that's the reason why soon they're going to be increasing it to 12 euros an hour. Uh, and that's going to require, like, what if they increase it to 12 euros an hour and platforms who are not on employment contracts, who do not offer employment contracts, but offer freelance based jobs, where the worker gets to set the wage does not set it to 12. So that means that you know, a platform who may have gotten that score last year, is not going to get that score this year. So those scores are also not set in stone every year, we look at the same platforms or add new platforms to the list that we have. And depending on how the principle has changed, but also how the legal context or the local context has changed, the platforms may score higher or lower, depending, as I said, like on these factors. So these are all put into consideration year after year when we are re-evaluating these platforms and redoing all the interviews with both the workers and the management, and then discussing the scores with sometimes new team members, sometimes you know other uh, external team members that come in uh, to, to finalize the scores, basically. 
Okay, thank you, Cheryl. And also, yeah, if I may add, because I also working on the research for Indonesian team, uh, in Indonesia, we have to adjust some uh, principles because, for example, we don't really have standard living wage here. So we have to find what's the equivalent of a standard living wage in Indonesia and the standard uh, in the principles, we try to improve the principles all the time. So maybe uh, one platform will get decent scores this year, maybe next year they will get lower score and that's always happened because the principle is always being improved. Okay, uh, so let's move on to other question from Melissa. Uh, okay, uh, Melissa LG, uh, the question is, since most or some of the cloud work platforms are not local based, do workers expect the local government to play a role in addressing the challenges they face or instead all responsibility is on the platform? I think this question uh, would be suitable for um, UNA and Busheril because there are many platforms in uh, both countries that are based in uh, other countries and often government is not really hands-on uh, in regulating the platform. So please, um, Bu Cheryl or Bu Yuana. Um, uh, do you okay, I can, I can go first. Um, the question is uh, asking about uh, the workers' expectations, whether the expectations of cloud workers go to the government or to the platforms more. So. The work, the in our in our research, the cloud workers' um, uh, expectations from the government is more of to help them with training, for example, or to help them with improving the quality of internet connectivity. In terms of training, the the expectation is that they will train them so that they will be placed in a better negotiating capacity with clients. So, for example, if you are, are, if your skills are more of the micro task kind, then most likely the rates that you will demand from the, the, from the platform will be uh, commanding lower rates. But if, if you can get training that's, that will prepare you for asking for higher rates, then workers feel that that would be better. But it's more of that than <laughs> bargaining for structural changes um, um, that cloud work platforms can institute and asking government to do anything about that. And this, despite cloud work platforms being globally set, um, I, I believe, uh, Os could correct me here, uh, or, or, or Yuana, but I believe that there has been a case uh, in the context of Crowdflower, where the, the local, uh, well, the, the a country labor law has been um, um, engaged um, to kind of uh, in the context of workers trying to find for a settlement agreement to claim for minimum wages. So this they invoke the U.S. Fair Labor Standards Act. In my understanding, and they they uh, apparently uh, in my understanding that. Um, crowd flower uh, uh, um, was uh, was put in a spotlight in that context invoking a, a labor law. So I think it, it might be possible, but in the Philippine context, we are quite far from this. Um, the, the, the government is still at the stage of promoting cloud work as a jobs generation mechanism because it helps us sewage the numbers in terms of ICT jobs generation. Yeah, uh, I think I will add a little bit uh, on that. What would be the expectations from workers to the government in, in the case of the cloud workers? Well, based on my research, well, when we discuss about the futures of work in the platform economy, there are four uh, criteria in social uh, technology economy and also, as well as in the government regulations. I think overall, in general, the expectations toward the government role is as enabler for this uh, cloud works to work. What does it mean as enabler? First, in terms of technology, the expectations is uh, for the government to provide a better digital infrastructures as well as a mechanism to improve on digital talents. And in terms of uh, uh, social uh, and economic sectors, there is an expectation on how to uh, improve uh, 
or not improve, how to minimize labor exploitations by a strong, uh, strong uh, law that recognize uh, the positions of this cloud work, which is actually now in Indonesia, we're still very much debating about the classification of this work. Uh, and I think that will be the first step from the governments to formally recognize uh, the distinction of this uh, cloud work and gig workers in that sense, it will give uh, legal protections for the for this worker to do that job. Thank you so much, Ibu Cheryl and Ibu Yona, for your answer. Um, uh, the question from Melissa will be our last is our last question, and now we have come to the end of the Q and A session. But before I wrap up this uh, event. I would like to hear some closing remarks from Buyana, Ibu Sheryl, and us regarding uh, what do you think of the future of work and what can we do to create a better and fairer working conditions for everyone, especially gig worker. Maybe uh, we could start with Buyana and then us, and lastly, uh, Ibu Sheryl. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, when we discuss about the future of work, it is very important to have collective imaginary to decide and navigate where are the future of works. I think uh, in my presentations, I mentioned the way I see right now in Indonesia, uh, we tend to listen more on this powerful actors in technology companies or powerful actors who have more access to, to the platform economy. But we not really listen to people or to the stakeholders who also depend on their life in this platform economy. So then in that sense, I would urge for us to have more uh, collective imaginary about the futures of platform works. Just echoing what Joanna has said, um, in this economy, we often, I mean, depends on where, of course, in the last year, things have been changing a little, I think, due to activism, but we often read numbers, money, uh, a lot of dollar signs, euro signs, companies becoming unicorns, what's a unicorn, that's a billion dollar company that, you know, gets investment, so a lot of investment money. We read a lot of that, especially during COVID, because of the inflation of the markets when it comes to platform economy. So we've seen a lot of new actors come into play, but also a lot of these actors getting a ton of investment money, billions uh, in some cases, millions accumulating into a billion or more in many cases. But what happened in the last couple of months? That money is gone now. Now there is recession in some countries. There is also uh, investment fear because we know at this stage, many of these platforms are actually operating on losses. They're not making profit. Even the big ones out there that operate multinationally are operating on loss losses. And that means this money is speculative. So the, the economy itself is also speculative. I don't foresee the, the platform economy or the platforms them, themselves to cease to exist. I think platform economy is the future in one form or the other but it's our responsibility to ask ourselves in what form do we want to see this future economy to unfold? And here, two things come to mind. I think uh, one, first is a lot, for a lot of policymakers, a lot of things are still like on the table waiting to be dealt with. And one of the big ones out there is the classification of work that Yuana and Cheryl have also underlined. What kind of work does this consist of? Is this something that can be included in a contract and if so that also brings workers with a lot of safety net right with a lot of uh, benefits and if not then does that mean that workers have to continue on working on precarious conditions and be at the mercy of risks that are out there be at the mercy of another pandemic that just gets rid of all the jobs out there so that's something to discuss. And of course, we are in favor of a very swift discussion. The EU is right now having this discussion and uh, had a directive. So at the end of the year, I think we're going to have an answer to what the platform economy means for in the European context. And finally, collective voice. Like I said that this was something that was really big for our research in Germany because a lot of these uh, platforms, the workers have organized within the last year. 
some of them with repercussions, some of them have lost their jobs for organizing, for engaging in strikes, engaging in warehouse closures, etc. I was uh, with many of the workers in many of these uh, strikes as well. So it's very important for workers not to feel atomized and isolated, but to work together as, as you know, in, in actual legally acknowledged structures like works councils, like, you know, or through unions. And it's our responsibility, of course, in this future economy as academics, as journalists, as activists, to keep on supporting workers to ensure that they are not dealing with the brunt of precarity, but they're actually taken, we're all taking the necessary steps to make work a better experience for, uh, for, for, for the workers. Yeah, um, great points from my co-panelists. I guess all that I would say is that, well, technologies are there as tools that are supposed to make things better for us. And I guess the question we need to ask is, who is made better off by these technologies? And looking at who is made better off in a holistic sense, no? And it, we have to remember that platforms are technologies, but behind them are human beings. Human beings design the platforms. Human beings implement the platform economy. Human beings perform the service that makes this platform economy function. And human beings buy work from these platforms. And so we need to continually highlight the human dimension of the platform economy a bit more so that we can work under the principle of humane labor and work under the principle of social justice rather than just profit. Thank you so much, uh, Buyuana, Bushario, and Oz for sharing such a great insight and knowledge. And uh, there is some participants that already uh, asking us, is there any way to reach you all after the webinar? Maybe if you, if there's uh, like, maybe if you have a e email address or social media account that uh, can be used to connect, uh, please type it down on the chat box. Yeah, just to add, you can also go mm -hmm. to Fairwork websites and we have a contact form there. Uh, I, I don't want to like, you know, be the representative. We have three, also two other Fairwork researchers here and we have dozens more out there that are doing fascinating <laughs> research in other country contexts. So if you have any questions, if of course, if they're directed you know, at me directly, then I'd be more than happy to uh, be the respondent for it. But if you have like general questions about the research we do, uh, then feel free to go to the website, it's www.fair.work. And from there you can reach to all of us basically. Thank you so much, Oz. Uh, okay, once again, I want to thank our speakers for uh, the contribution to this discussion. I will also thank all participants for your kind attention and participation. It's been a great pleasure to moderate uh, this, this session. And before I uh, wrap up the event, I would like to announce that Saska, Melissa LG, and Cheryl my lady, congratulations. You will receive merchandise from the Gute Institute. And our staff our, will uh, email you later. Or please check the chat box for the details. Once again, thank you so much for uh, all of you. Thank you so much, Gute Institute, CFDS, Engage Media. See you on our next digital discourse. On October, I'm Amelina, your moderator, signing off and goodbye. Thank you so much, Buyuana, Musharil, Kanos. Thank you all. <laughs>